neck, I need a neck brace. I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association's Facebook page and our series, Meet the Experts. In a few moments, we're going to start a conversation with Dr. John Lynn Jeffries of Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center and the University of Cincinnati Hospital in Ohio. And we will, at the end of our discussion, take some questions from the audience related to questions on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or the program out in Cincinnati specifically. Now, as this is Facebook, I'm going to take a few minutes and chat with you while people populate and join us so they don't miss any bit of this. But we're already getting some people joining us, so that's always a good thing. In today's talk, we're going to get to know a little bit more about the program at Cincinnati Children's and the adult program at the university. And we're going to get to know our friend, Dr. Jeffries, just a little bit more. So without further ado, Dr. Jeffries, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thanks, Lisa, for having me. Um, so I'm a practicing cardiologist here, as you heard, at Cincinnati Children's and the University of Cincinnati. Uh, my background is a little bit unusual. I did uh, my residency and training both in internal medicine and pediatrics. So that means I can take care of both children and adults. I did a master's in public health that was really related to quality of life. So specifically in patients like HCM. And then I went on to do a, a combined cardiology fellowship in Houston. So I did an adult cardiovascular fellowship at a place called the Texas, uh, Texas Heart Institute. And I did my pediatric cardiology at Texas Children's. And during that time, many of my mentors in Houston uh, were big experts, uh, offered a lot of expertise in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I really gravitated towards that as a career passion uh, and started directing the uh, cardiomyopathy program there in Texas uh, shortly after I came on staff. Also directed a cardiovascular genetics program, which you know is very important as well. Uh, I stayed in Houston until 2010 and then I moved to Cincinnati to direct the advanced heart failure and cardiomyopathy programs here. Uh, before I came here, we really didn't have a dedicated heart failure program. Now we have one of the largest cardiomyopathy programs in the country. Um, and so we see all, all the typical uh, variants of cardiomyopathy and have a very large hypertrophic cardiomyopathy population. That's a lot of work you've done to get to this point in your career. Um, and we appreciate it within the HCM community. You have such a wealth of knowledge, especially with our, our pediatric population, which right. is still a little, um, as far as I'm concerned, not well understood. There, there's still a lot, to, a lot of lessons to be learned here. I would agree. And we've been involved in a lot of multi-center research efforts to do that using newer technologies like cardiac MRI and younger patients. When is that initial onset of disease? And I think we're going to find that it's going to really turn out to be earlier and earlier than what we've previously sort of anticipated. I think as the technologies get better, the smarter we get as far as being able to make that diagnosis, get people in the right kind of screening, longitudinal follow-up, and then ultimately the right kind of medical therapies. I agree. I, I think it will be really fascinating for us to see how early we can identify when changes are occurring. You know, Absolutely. in today's world, we're waiting for those echo measurements to change. And are we already missing that onset because we're waiting? I agree, for agree completely. Agree completely. So that'll be really interesting. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the structure of the program there? Um, we have an adult and a pediatric program. So explain how patients Great. navigate through that system. Sure. So um, we have our pediatric program here at Cincinnati Children's and then our adult program at the University of Cincinnati. And, and the, it's really uh, the, the difference between the two um, uh, uh, locations is based purely on age. So if you're 25 or younger, you come to Cincinnati Children's Hospital. If you're 26 and older, you would go to the University of Cincinnati. You still see the same provider, which is me. Um, here at Cincinnati Children's, we have a robust team of cardiomyopathy experts. There are five other physicians that are involved with the care of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We have nurse practitioners. We have a, a large cadre of research personnel uh, that help us with our HCM research efforts. Similarly, at University of Cincinnati, you would be seen by me. Um, there is another physician and a, and a nurse practitioner there who are interested in also see HCM patients. And uh, that provider has uh, over two decades of experience with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Obviously, the complete care 
involves having access to electrophysiologists, catheterization doctors, surgeons, um, both of which are part of the teams here at, at Cincinnati Children's and at the University of Cincinnati. And then obviously we employ the use of genetics and genotyping. And so that involves genetics both here at Children's as well as the University of Cincinnati. That's a comprehensive program you have there. And that's why you an HCMA recognized center of excellence. Because that's right. And the, the, the that's depth something we're very depth. proud of. And, and we, we are too. We are definitely proud of that. So you have lots of choices in career paths when you're a physician. What is it about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy specifically that caught your interest and why do you do what you do? You know, I think it's really just because it's one of those opportunities to make a high impact uh, in the community and in patients' lives. When I was a trainee, I uh, dealt with a family who had lost uh, a young son uh, playing football and I became uh, intimately attached to this family and still am in contact to them with them to this day. And that, at that point, it was sort of a pivotal point for me that I wanted to try and make a difference, that I wanted to do research, that I wanted to see these patients to avoid those sorts of outcomes. And I think we've started to make a dent into that. You know, as you know, and as many know, the right kind of, with the right kind of medical therapy, outcomes are fantastic in the setting of this disease, but you have to be aware, the education has to be there, the right kind of follow-up, the right kind of testing. And so that pivotal point for me in my career helped me to decide that I wanted to be an HCM expert for the rest of, of my life, of my medical career. And uh, I think it's, it's really served me well. I'm very passionate about the care of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, and we are fortunate enough to get uh, referrals from all over the globe to come and see us. And we get a lot of second and third opinions uh, from large centers in the United States to really understand the phenotypic um, sort of, of uh, representation. Do I have HCM or not? But also, if, if you do have HCM, what are the right kind of medical therapies? What should we anticipate over time? Are we doing the right kind of screening for all the at-risk first-degree relatives? All those things have become really important. So a lot of my job is not only just to treat the patient, but to treat the family and to educate the family and the patients to what they should anticipate over time and to make sure that those people are, that are at risk are actually being followed in a, in a proper way. And I, I'm very, I feel very, very strongly about that. And that's how a big part of how our clinic has grown is that we have those index cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and we start screening the at-risk individuals and we find more and more cases. As you know, this happens all over the United States at, at HCM, uh, a similar centers of excellence. So I think that that's one of the key messages is we're not just treating a patient, we're treating a family. And I think people really, really appreciate that opportunity. So with my background, I can see multiple generations of patients in one clinic setting. And I think families benefit from hearing a consistent message uh, and uh, really understanding the genetics behind the disease, but also what to anticipate from a phenotypic perspective over time. And then obviously making sure that we mitigate the risk of sudden cardiac death and trying to mitigate the uh, symptoms that may be associated with the disease. And I think we do a, a good job of that, both on the adult and the pediatric side. As you know, many of our pediatric patients are completely asymptomatic. So we really have to be thoughtful in how we care for those patients and making sure we're doing the right kind of screening testing uh, to detect uh, for obstruction, to detect for any kind of uh, arrhythmias. So um, because many of the adolescents and young adults aren't always cognizant of their symptoms or maybe don't want to let us know about their symptoms. And so we try and get about that, you know, try and get at those answers by doing testing and by helping uh, to um, to foster relationships where they can trust us to talk to about talk to us about um, the symptoms that they may have and understand that we can treat their disease and help them to feel better. So uh, I would agree with you, as you said earlier, the pediatric side is a little bit different than the adult side. And it's somewhere where I like to invest a lot of my time because I think the benefits are so high. You know, a seven year old still has another 80 years to live and there's a lot of care and it's gonna be cardiac care for the rest of their life. So for us to impact that age group, I think is, is hugely important and something we're very, very passionate about. You brought up a couple of really interesting points in that talk there. And I want to do a few of them. Okay. You mentioned treating family. And by treating a family with HCM, we have to do a lot of screening. Right. And I have found that there's awful, oftentimes a barrier to getting some family members screened. Do you guys employ any tricks or hints or tips 
to get sure. their family members in for screening? We've been pretty fortunate that, you know, uh, for those patients that maybe the insurance denies the opportunity to be screened, we can usually overcome that with a simple call. Um, genetic testing is a similar idea where maybe we identify a pathogenic genotype in our index case and we want to use that to screen the rest of the families. Usually a simple phone call is all it requires for us to be able to get a pre-authorization for genetic testing. But for things like cardiac MRIs, echocardiography, uh, clinic visits, We've actually been very fortunate that we haven't had a lot of insurance pushback. And I think it, it's because it just requires one call from me saying, listen, this is an important disease that can result in a fatal outcome. You need to approve this uh, simply because it's the right thing to do. And I'll have to say that we really have been pretty fortunate that our payer mix, regardless of what it is, is we've, we've actually done very well and haven't had a lot of problems. We don't turn any patients away. We figure out a way to see them um, because it is so important. But I think the revenue that we've been able to generate has been more than adequate to cover the needs of our program. That's fantastic. You brought up something else, too, that I think is critical to any good HCM program, but a concept lost on most of medical treatment today. And that is we are treating a family. Correct. It's the individual patient in front of you. It's the person in front of you and the person sitting next to them who may become the person in front of you at any moment. So it does require a bit of finesse trying to manage multiple people with different presentations of the same right. disease. Any tips for helping families balance what's good for one is not necessarily what's right for the other? I think, you know, the that one of the things we would obviously consider or, or strongly suggest is that people go to providers that have expertise in HCM. Um, that's probably the first uh, three messages, you know, that that's a very important thing, I think, for longitudinal care because people that are in those centers of excellence or people that are familiar with the disease are gonna be able to explain that the phenotypes can be very different. We're talking about one genetic mutation in the milieu of 25,000 different genes, and there can be epigenetic phenomena, uh, there can be um, environmental phenomena that change how the patient looks, what their heart looks like, what, the what we would call a cardiac phenotype. So there can be great variability within a family uh, that harbor exactly the same mutation. But I think that, that message has to be consistently delivered. So it can't be, just be at that one clinic visit. It has to be over and over. And people need to understand that what their heart looks like today may not be what it looks like five years from now or 10 years from now. And I think you're obviously a perfect example of that. Um, so I think um, as long as people are educated and it's an ongoing educational process, we've tried to develop handouts, web-based tools, uh, tools for our site to really educate people about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I think the other thing that I personally try and do is that every patient that I see gets my email. Uh, and if they have a question when they go home and say, well, that just didn't make sense, or I'm not sure I understood everything correctly, they email me. So I spend a fair amount of my day responding to my patients and their families, which I hugely enjoy because I would rather take the time for them to be properly educated as opposed to them wandering around, wondering what's going on, presenting to some local ER with chest pain and being mismanaged. So um, this, I think, is, a, is once again something I'm very passionate about is that I want my patients to have a good rapport with me and to feel comfortable to reach out. And if they ever have a question, they always have access. You brought up another good point. ER management, um, not exactly the list that we pre-discussed, but we find that when a patient has chest pain and they go to the emergency room, oftentimes there's nothing actually done for them. Right. Uh, sometimes they're given medications that are contraindicated, like nitroglycerin. Correct. Or they're ignored and told that it's anxiety and it's in their head and to go home and there's nothing wrong with them. Right. Do you have any tips for patients? when they present to the emergency room, and how to best protect themselves in that situation? I think, you know, the first thing, I'll tell you what our patients do, and I, I assume from what you're talking about, you're talking about a patient with a known diagnosis. Known diagnosis, yes. Yeah, the first thing that we have them do is to tell the, the ER provider that you're, you're an HCM patient, mm -hmm. and to encourage the family to ask that provider to give us a call before any management decisions are made, unless obviously if someone's an extremist and you have to do something urgently. But we've found it very useful because one of my team members is always on call, is that to have that ER provider give us a call, tell us what's going on and we can help direct them into the therapies that are appropriate. And as you said, to avoid those therapies that are inappropriate. 
So for us, that's worked out amazingly well. I think patients have to serve as their own self-advocates, right? And they have to serve as advocates for their families. And so to me, that's the way that we've, uh, I think, been able to get around that problem to a great degree. And it seems to work pretty well for us. Uh, so far, I think it is working very well for you. Uh, what do you see are challenges in front of us as a global HCM community in terms of management and research and getting patients to proper care? Where do you see challenges and do you have any ideas on how we might want to overcome them? Sure. I think, you know, one of the biggest concerns or con uh, problems are the number of providers out there that are well educated in the disease. And that's something that your organization and others are very intimately involved with. But I think it's uh, increasing the number of providers that can properly care for HCM and then increasing awareness, obviously, which is something else that you do very well. Um, families need to know what these potential risks are. And maybe that starts at the middle school level, the high school level. But I think families understanding that this is a potential risk and that the disease, uh, you know, we, we can't predict a priori who's going to develop the disease and who doesn't. But I think the biggest challenges on the horizon are having enough people that are adequately trained and well informed to care for the growing population of HCM patients that we see. Because just as we said, based on cascade screening, you know, you can easily go from having one patient to having 10 patients in a single family. And that really puts a burden on the providers. We don't want to we don't want um, one single provider trying to care for too many patients. We need more and more people out there who are actually familiar with the disease and who are willing to take this on. And so I think, you know, HCMA obviously is a, a great uh, uh, a great vehicle to make that happen. And I think these things like webinars and webcasts are very useful. Um, and unfortunately, you know, uh, the the untoward outcomes that do occur across the, the globe obviously also get attention from the media and otherwise. And those sorts of things help to increase awareness. But obviously, the goal is to avoid those untoward outcomes. And uh, so I think for me, as I said, the biggest problems on the horizon really are about how much access to care exists. I think from a research perspective, we're doing reasonably well. Um, we participate in a lot of multi-site trials, looking at things like using genotype to predict the phenotypic uh, sort of uh, uh, cardiac disease that may be that may manifest, and also novel drug therapies. So at the heart of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, things like fibrosis or scar tissue in the heart, are there medications out there that we can leverage to use to either slow um, the scar uh, progression or even maybe reverse it, which would be fantastic. So I think that there are real exciting opportunities out there. Um, we have good success with traditional therapies when it comes to alleviating obstruction and dealing with symptoms, but we really want to get at the heart of the matter, trying to treat something at the myocardial level. And that's those things are starting to become um, more and more available. And, and we are participants in those multicenter trials to look at some of these novel compounds that can have a very favorable effect on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, having an effect on contractility, maybe having effects on dysrhythmias and other things. So um, I think it's an exciting time. And I encourage patients to really, you know, make themselves aware, be Googling and looking online to say, what are the novel therapies out there? And if I want to explore that novel therapy, where should I go? Where do I have to go to do something like that? And uh, so for me, I think that this is a hugely exciting time. Um, so I think research is definitely on the upswing when it comes to HCM, but I still would like to see more people than just a few across the United States that are considered true experts in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Well, the, the promising news <coughs> there is as of last month, we've seen 29 regular centers That's great. <coughs> what are you exactly um, we have two more pending for our next board meeting, and we have six more that we're evaluating in the coming year. Right. Great. So, Wonderful. You know, I don't know that we'll ever get much more than 50, but we should approach a 40 number by the end of the year. And right. I would like to see a program in at least every state. There are mm -hmm. states that may not be able to tolerate, you know, the, the volume that's needed to the center of excellence. But we should have care for the majority of Americans within a few hour drive from their home. I agree. And if we started 22 years ago, we had five programs in the entire United States. Right. And we were probably taking care of within all of those programs, maybe two to 3,000 people. 
Sure. As of right now, we have about 40,000 affected individuals in proper treatment care within centers right. of influence. So we're getting Amazing. there. Absolutely. Because there's a million of us here in the United States. And, right. and we are going to work on international programs. So right. you'll be helping us with all that stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. And my, my parting question, and then we're going to go take questions and answers from our viewers. Sure. So we've talked an awful lot about some very complex work that you've been involved with, not only with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy specifically, but your master's in public health and your training. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you're not working? Yeah, I uh, spend time with my family. Mostly I have a son who's eight and a daughter who's six. So I help coach the basketball team and I uh, am uh, one of the overseers of our local uh, Boy Scouts efforts. Uh, I, I like to uh, be very physically active. So I like to run, hike, bike, do those sorts of things as well. Um, unfortunately, I don't have as much time as I would like to, to be able to do those sorts of things, but family is, is very important. So I try and make it to as many of the events that my children have, which are starting to increasingly become more frequent um, as much as I possibly can. Well, sounds like you're a great dad, and we do hope you take time to take care of yourself. Absolutely. You're in good shape so you can take care of all of us, right? right? Exactly. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start taking some questions, and you're going to see these little bubbles pop up here. And we'll address what questions we can. Let's look at what Julie has. Julie had two questions. Um, and the recommendation for children and teens with multiple family members affected by HOCOM is to get an ICD as a prevention. So why don't you talk about sudden death uh, risk factors? Yeah, so when traditional sudden death risk factors are really based on some older data that were generated in adults. So those have to do with the thickness of the myocardium, uh, a history of syncope or passing out, a history of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, family history of sudden death, and then an abnormal change in blood pressure on exercise testing. And then there are some newer criteria that leverage things that we see on cardiac MRI based on scar burden that those patients may be felt to be at, at risk for uh, sudden death. The use of an ICD in younger kids is a challenging situation. Some kids are, are so small that the device itself would have to be placed on the outside of the heart or what's called an epicardial device. Um, that's pretty rare. Um, we don't typically do that. But we do know that in our younger patients and our adolescents and our young adults, some of these do have some of these patients do have the risk factors for sudden death. For sudden death. You have to remember that these devices like an ICD don't last forever. And then younger patients, the, the chance for a lead fracture or something else is, is reasonably high. So we have to go into it in a very thoughtful manner and adjudicate just how much of a risk do we think that the that this patient is at uh, at the current uh, uh, point in time. And then it's really a joint discussion between the providers and the family to say, is this something you feel strongly about putting in? And we have had patients where, you, you know, when we see multiple risk factors, we just think that it's really so high that an ICD is an appropriate uh, therapeutic strategy. But we, we really are very thoughtful about that. Not everyone who comes in with it with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is going to get an ICD. But you have to remember these risk factors that I were talk, was talking about change over time. So back once again to making sure you're seeing the right kind of a provider and are they doing the right kind of longitudinal assessments to look for all those things, obviously. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so let's talk about screening. Um, Julie has another question, which is pertinent to this talk. Um, the children continue to be screened every one to two years since they're quite young. They're now 20 and 15. Right. We know the guidelines are every 12 to 18 months, ages 12 to mid-20s. Right. What do you think about those guidelines and what would you do? You know, we're pretty conservative. I think every one to two years is reasonable for those patients that don't have a known genotype diagnosis. If you have known have, are known to have a pathogenic mutation uh, in one of the HCM causing genes, we would actually see you at least every year. So part of this question is really going to be based on, do you know what your genotype is and have you been found to have pathog a pathogenic genetic mutation? You know, for us, people have always considered this a disease of younger people, but I can tell you personally that I've made the initial diagnosis of HCM in people in their 50s. So the idea that you're out of the woods at some certain age, I personally don't agree with. I think that it can manifest at, at later periods in life. And that once again, if you're at risk, I think some sort of screening needs to be provided 
uh, into uh, into much later uh, adulthood. The intervals of that can vary based on the, the center that you're seen at. But the idea that you never need to see a cardiologist again, I personally just don't agree with because the risk factors are still there. Yeah, we have a number of families who were diagnosed in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. Absolutely. Absolutely. And somebody else in the family had been diagnosed earlier, earlier, the kind of they didn't follow up. Yeah. People usually think that our index cases start with a child or an adolescent, but actually in many of our cases, it's exactly the other direction where uh, a grandparent or a parent comes in is found to have HCM, and then we start screening the younger patients as opposed to going from young to old. So um, uh, it's something that um, we have to factor in uh, and don't take anything for granted just because a patient is 40 or 50 years of age. Do not rule out the idea that this could be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I just had a case yesterday where yeah. the young man was diagnosed 20s, 30s, and then his mother was diagnosed um, having a screening. And he was blown away that it went the other way rather than mom getting diagnosed and then him. I said, you're actually the common one. Right. So, <clears throat> Tracy has a question. Should DNA testing a while back and it be inconclusive, when do you revisit that and when do you screen families? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So obviously the ability to uh, sort of deeper genotyping, we call it, so better DNA testing um, becomes more and more available all the time. We usually revisit the idea of should we uh, do repeat genetic testing about every three to five years? And I think it's something that's a, a worthwhile discussion with your provider. If your results were inconclusive, you know, the, the key thing about genetic testing is that you want to test the person who has the phenotype. So meaning that they have evidence of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That's the person that you want to do the genotyping on. And then if you are uh, if you are um, able to identify one of, one of these mutations that is disease causing, then you use that to screen the rest of the family. We don't recommend screening someone who's at risk, who doesn't have any evidence of disease with genetic testing as a first case scenario. Um, it should always be because one of their relatives has evidence of HCM and a pathogenic mutation. Good answer. Okay. Um, we brought up nitroglycerin earlier talking about the serum. So yes. is nitro contraindicated in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? It can cause a lot of problems, as we've alluded to, simply because it, it affects blood pressure. And so it can change both what we call preload and afterload. It can actually make obstruction worse uh, in the setting of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So that comes back to that idea before you're going to allow someone to administer a medication to you, it would be very helpful for that provider to talk to um, your HCM provider before they give any of these medications. They're probably giving nitro because they think the chest pain is some sort of an anginal kind of an equivalent or something to do with an acute coronary syndrome but patients with HCM have to be thought about completely differently. So once again, encourage patients to be their own self advocates and to make sure that they tell the ER doc, listen, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but I would prefer you talk to my provider before we go down this route of giving a medication that might cause some problems. And you can, you know, you can go on the web and figure out a list of medications that we typically would try and avoid in the setting of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and it may be a good thing for you just to familiarize yourself with those medications, keep them in mind. But um, people aren't trying to do the wrong thing in the ER. They're just treating things that they think are common. And having chest pain and having an acute coronary syndrome is very common, right, in the United States. It's going to be more common than someone coming in with HCM. So they're just treating, you know, the common things that they're dealing with. The, you're a special case. You're a, a unique case where the use of certain types of medications we might use for an acute coronary syndrome would not be of benefit to you and actually may be harmful. So we have a couple of really interesting questions here. So her, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce the first name, but Ms. Jones, we're gonna call you. You have a five-year-old who was diagnosed last May, started on beta blockers right away, still suffering from dizziness, and clutches his wrist a lot. What can you do to optimize the therapy and bring in some So I think the first thing is to really document whether he has obstruction or not. You know, he may be having symptoms that could be caused from something else. 
breathlessness, um, chest clutching could also be reactive airways disease or asthma. So I think one of the things we would want to make sure is there actually obstruction at the level of the, of the left ventricular outflow tract. And can that be provoked, meaning with stress or otherwise, does that, uh, does that um, amount of obstruction increase? If, if there is obstruction there and it seems to be temporally related to the symptoms we're talking about, the first thing would be to optimize the beta blocker therapy. So in pediatric patients, it's very common that uh, patients are, un, are underdosed. And so you would want to make sure that the patient is actually receiving an optimal dose of optimal dose of beta blockade. If that, if you're on an optimal dose and it still wasn't making a difference, other medicine, medicines like dipyridamol may be considered uh, as an additive therapy that might help a little bit with that. But you know, when you if if we've tried all the medical therapies that we can and we're still having symptoms and we feel very confident that it's related to the obstruction that's when you start talking about things like myectomies and surgical interventions, which we've re really very, very rarely have ever had to consider in patients in the, a five to 10 year old range. That's just something that we typically don't do. So I would encourage you to go back to your provider. One, make sure that this is really related to the obstruction. And then two, make sure that the right dose of medication is being administered. So um, Moody, I'm going to put your two questions together here. Um, the one question was, what is prognosis for children? Mm -hmm. But the other is a bit more specific, but a great question. My son was tested and they find a gene on him, but not in me or my father, he or his father, um, she or her father, the child's father. Um, are they still at risk? Number one. And number two, what's the prognosis for a child in that circumstance? You know, the prognosis for children with HCM is, is really very, very good, especially if you're followed in the right kind of center and the right kind of therapies are employed. Meaning, you know, we use medications when we need to. We use defibrillators when we need to. But most importantly, we, acti we activity restrict when we need to. So we're avoiding things like competitive sports, which is obviously one of those risk factors that we want to take into consideration when we're dealing with patients. When it comes back to this idea that your, their son has a pathogenic mutation, I can tell you we don't know all the genetics um, behind hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So is it possible that either mom or dad harbor a mutation that is disease causing? It is possible and it, it may just mean that the test that we used to, to look at the, ge the genetic information was incomplete. We just don't know all the genes right now. So it is always a possibility. But it sounds like that at least in their son, this was probably a spontaneous mutation so one that wasn't existent in either the dad or the mom, which obviously definitely happens. That's how people are different and how these things start over time is that the index case has to start with some patient, obviously, and this may be the case. So, but do keep in mind that we, we have a known number of, of genes that we test for, but that list is not comprehensive. We do not know all the genes that are causative of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you wanna keep that in mind and um, you know, it's an, it can be an ongoing discussion with your provider. So we now have a question from one of your existing patients. Uh, or um, and that is, and that is her husband's a patient. You have three kids, no clinical signs, but often the children are complaining of arrhythmias or chest discomfort. Mm -hmm. Sign of things like that, is this preclinical well, it's definitely possible, you know, if you don't have a thickening of the myocardium and let's say that we took that patient, those three kids and we did cardiac MRIs and there was no evidence of scar tissue, um, we can do types of surveillance to look for arrhythmias. We can do EKGs and Holter monitors, but there are other things when, when children complain of chest discomfort, it's more common to be musculoskeletal than it is to be cardiac especially if the kids have been screened and their echocardiograms look normal. Not saying it's out of the question that it couldn't be something related to HCM, but it's more likely to be something else. What we typically do is very conservative where we do the right kind of testing to make sure that none of those things are evident. Let's say we do Holter monitor, maybe we don't want to do a stress test, whatever the case may be, we would individualize that therapy. Um, if those things are negative, then we would say that it is very, very unlikely that the cause of the chest discomfort is cardiac in origin. And then we would start trying to look, well, what are the other possibilities that it could be? Could this be gastroesophageal reflux? Could this be asthma? Could this be something else that's non-cardiac related? So that's where we would partner with primary care physicians to make sure that the right kind of testing was being done because we don't want 
our, our patients suffering with chest pain simply because one, it's, it's not a pleasant, it impacts quality of life. But two, obviously, uh, we want to make sure that we're risk stratifying people the best way possible and we're not missing anything. So that's how we would typically think about a patient like that. We're going to make this the last question. Um, and this is from uh, Trisha, and she said she had heart flutters when she was in the sixth grade, but she never told anyone. And then at 30, she was diagnosed with um, HCM, or 30 years later. Now she has an ICD. Um, I lost that one. Um, now she has an ICD. Do we think the HCM started when she was 12? It's a, great, it's a great question. It's entirely possible. I can tell you all of us can have flutterings. So I have flutterings, but I know I don't have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it's possible that that fluttering had nothing to do with HCM per se. Obviously, you're born with the genetic mutation that's causative of the disease. So is it possible that over 30 years ago you had a what we would say phenotypic evidence or did you, if someone had done an echocardiogram on you, would they have detected hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? It's definitely possible. Uh, it's one of those things that's impossible to know. What we would say is that you're very fortunate, you know, that you made it through if that fluttering was related to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You made it a long time and now you're in the right kind of uh, getting the right kind of care. You have a defibrillator in place, which is going to offer that safety net for you uh, long term to be able to live the life you want to live. But it's really very hard to know if you had presence of disease that far back, but it's definitely, definitely possible. I will just add a personal answer to it there that my daughter, my daughter four, four, walking in walking in here one day, one day mommy, my mommy, mommy, my mommy, her echoes have echoes. I found out when I was seven, she was a carrier, carrier, and at 10, she turned to be really positive. Right. If you're in an age family, family, I would document those cases, I would That's report true. them. I got my daughter an echo when she started complaining, everything was normal. Right. We did a lot of surveillance, a lot of nervous nights, I'll admit, but in the end, we got her the right treatment. So right. just because a kid feels something doesn't mean that a cardiac arrest is around the corner. So stay calm because right. we've all survived until this point and our hearts did whatever they did before we knew that they were doing them. Exactly. My diagnosis didn't come till I was 12, but it was probably there earlier than that. But right. I made it to hard to me with that heart. Yeah. But I agree with you completely. You know, I think, as I've said multiple times, we're very conservative. And if there's a family history, we really we pull on that string as hard as we can to make sure we're not missing anything, which I think is the key component to all of that. Well, that's a lot of great information we shared with our viewers over the past half an hour. Thank so you. Thank you very much for spending your time to help us with the community today. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Uh, ours. Ours more so. <laughs> so I, I hope if anybody's in need of a pediatric cardiologist and they don't know where to go, they now great available to them in the Cincinnati Children's Program and the Affiliated Adult Program. And Dr. Jeffries can take care of you. Um, I do encourage you all to sign in tomorrow. We'll be having a very interesting guest who comes to us all the way from India has a really cool HCM person in India and the man literally made me cry at the end of the day and that and tell his story as well as tomorrow for a patient story and some really great tips on how to get your medical records in order to have your doctors visit. So um, Dr. Jeffries thank you so much for your time today and we hope to have you join us. Thanks again everyone. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. <laughs> And Brooke.